Gilgis Alexander. McCollum staying with him. Spins, gets inside. Left handed off the glass. Oh, what a sweet move. Giddy, tough spot. Back door. What a pass. What a play. And J Dub picks the pocket of Trey Young. He'll take it himself. This is Luke Hart. You're listening to the Uncontested. Ooh, what is up, Thunder fans? And welcome to the Uncontested Post Game Podcast Edition. I am your host for tonight, Taylor Peterson. You can find me on Twitter at uh, and all social media platforms at Taylor underscore P15. You can find us on all social media platforms as well. We're really pumped to you too. So I already see a ton of you already in the chat, already in the stream. Be sure to continue to uh, drop those comments. I'll be sure to try and get to them. Uh, as much as I can, it gets very hard when there's a lot of you in here and I'm going solo, <laughs> but I greatly appreciate it. So keep dropping comments, questions, etc. I'll try and get to them. Thank you to all of you who are already tuning into the stream as well. Uh, you can find us, like I said, on all social media platforms outside of YouTube, uh, X, Instagram, TikTok, you name it, we're there. Uh, we are a proud part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. And brought to you all by Dave's Hot Chicken and Spark OKC, which we will get into. And has some fun, exciting news coming up there as well. Uh, you guys have heard us mention it, but one more game left. One more regular season game left in the OKC Thunders schedule. Uh, on Sunday at 2.30, the Thunder will be playing the Dallas Mavericks. Also, we'll be breaking that down here later in this postgame podcast. But all of us, all five of us actually, uh, minus Kamiar. I don't think Kamiar is going to be able to make it because he's out of town. But there will at least be five of us there. Uh, at Spark OKC, right across from the arena. As soon as the game's over, we'll be going over, getting set up. You can hang out with us for a little bit as we wait for our seedings to be finalized. I'm also excited to break that down a little bit tonight and get into some of the seeding and playoff scenarios. Uh, but we will be going live at Spark OKC. I'm really excited to be there with all the guys. It's going to be a ton of fun. So if you're going to the game Sunday, be sure to come across the street to, to Spark OKC, get the club special, the Thunder Club special, specials that they're having they're uh, doing a, a nice little special there for us um on those drinks as well as the amazing pink fries it's, it's just like the staple one of my go-to's and so many great burgers uh come out come watch us pod eat some amazing food and let's have a great great time i think it's going to be amazing weather so i'm hoping we'll be out on the patio can't wait some of our guys are actually going to the game while silva and myself will be there at spark watching the game and kind of getting set up so if you're not going to the game or you don't want to get tickets, come out and hang out with Silva and I. It'll be a ton of fun. So really looking forward to seeing you all out there. And a huge shout out to our good friends over at Spark OKC and Dave's Hot Chicken. The Dave's Hot Chicken live watch party was incredible. And we cannot wait for this, uh, this upcoming opportunity with Spark on Sunday. Like I mentioned, the Thunder beat the Bucks. Bucks. 125-107. They are now in first place in the west i know there's kind of some uh, conflicting feelings about potentially ending up in first in the first seed we'll break those down as we get to the podcast but i think it's time you know we, we keep talking about it, it, the thunder are playing so much better and the season obviously <laughs> they're playing incredible and i think with the rising expectations that the, the team playing well those expectations continue to rise and i'm not sure we really as a fan base have done a great job of just in, really putting this into per, uh, perspective and really looking at what this actually means. And so I saw a tweet earlier. This is from Nick Van Exit uh, earlier today before the, all the games tonight happened. There are currently 10 teams in the West who are 10 games over 500. And here's how many we've had in the West uh, over the past. I mean, he, he lists them all out, all the way back to like the 90s. I'm just going to go through the last couple of seasons. But this year, there's 10 teams, like you mentioned. Last season, 2023, there were three. 2022, there were seven. 2021, there were seven. 2020, COVID season, bubble season, there were seven. 19 and 18, uh, 2019, 2018, there were eight and nine. There hasn't been, like going all the way back down to like 2007, there haven't been more than 10 teams over 500. That's how crazy this Western Conference is. And the Thunder, with one game left in the regular season, the second youngest team in the NBA, and if you look at their starters, um, as well as the teams who get, or sorry, the players who get regular rotation minutes, they actually, uh, I think they average as the youngest team who have, <laughs> trying to think how to word this, the players who play are younger than any other team in the NBA. Maybe it's a good way to word that. 
and Hear the Thunder are currently at first in the West. Technically a three-way tie at the top of the West, but Thunder currently have the tiebreaker. We will get into that. Pretty insane. Pretty insane to, to put that into perspective. And like I said, I know there's some uh, conflicting thoughts about the Thunder being in first, first, second, or third. We'll get into those. But before we do, let's go ahead and get into this game. Thunder absolutely dominated. Uh, first and foremost, the biggest point here, J-Dub wears the uncontested shirt, the dog shirt. Pretty incredible. Uh, Dub comes out with the shirt. We sent one to him uh, and sent an, an additional one to him for J-Will to have since they were kind of the founders of this. Really hope J-Will has his shirt as well and gets to wear it. But our guy Nick Crane was actually at the game covering the game for us and uh, he he walks out there, sees Dub walk out, and immediately has a shirt. And apparently, as Dub walks out with that shirt on, all the crowd starts barking. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I know Mark Tumbleson, head of Thunder PR, like <laughs> kind of pulled him off to the side to look at the shirt. So shout out to our guy Justin, who continues to do just incredible work for us with all of our graphics, all of our our shirts and merchandise. Um, and it's pretty rewarding and really cool to see J Dub rock that. So big shout out to J Dub. Also, just to tease something. Stay tuned after Sunday and this next week as our guy Justin has been in the lab and has some incredible uh, – for the longtime listeners, if you remember um, back when the Thunder were in the playoffs, we were covering the team. Justin did some really cool graphics for us. He's going to be doing even more of that. This is his some of his best work yet. So there's a little tease for you all. Stay tuned for the uncontested social media channels. We'll have all those posted after Sunday's game. Moving on, Hayward started for Giddy, who was out tonight due to a, a quote-unquote hit bruise, I believe. Uh, only Giddy's second game missed this season. We've talked about the ups and downs of Josh Giddy's season, but the uh, reliability of him has just been incredible. And the fact that this was only his second game missed, and technically it sounds like he probably could have played. Just another one of those nights where the Thunder wanted to give another one of their starters a night off. We saw Lou Dort not play a couple nights ago. I think this was the case with Giddy. Would not be surprised if we see him play in the regular season finale coming up. Uh, so no Giddy tonight, and Hayward starts in this place after coming back from his minor injury. No Giannis, obviously, because he's uh, out for the the rest of the regular season, and we'll see come playoff time. Uh, not a lot of details there in Giannis, but no Dane for Milwaukee as well as he was rested. And honestly, uh, I actually saw something, and I may have missed it pregame, but I think Doc Rivers mentioned that he – had a bit of a minutes restriction already on the rest of the starters who were going to play for the Bucks, And we did see that. None of the starters played in the fourth quarter, which makes sense because the Thunder were up by a decent amount. But even when it was still like a 12-point game heading into the fourth, we did not see those starters for Milwaukee. So uh, just something to note there. Regardless, that just shows you how great the Thunder played. Even when those starters were in, they went on some huge runs. Can't wait to get into that. Um, but the Thunder just dominated. And uh, the starters got to sit there at some in the fourth quarter, which was awesome to see. Knock on wood, doesn't appear to be any injuries. So let's just go ahead and jump into my big themes of the night. I have Shea and Dub attack early. I have Aaron Wiggins continues to save basketball, as always. Chet dominates. Chet was fantastic tonight. The Thunder defense, at least two transition offense. I thought the, the Thunder defense really locked in there after the first quarter, and we saw them play their style of basketball, which really was just kind of the epitome of this game, and it's the reason they were able to go up so much on the Bucks. Thunder three-point shooting, I just want to mention, because it wasn't great tonight, and the Thunder still were, were able to win. And then, obviously, we are going to get into the Thunder seeding implications. Um, just a quick game breakdown. Like I said, I mean, really quick. Both teams came out hot in the first quarter. I thought the Bucks were just making some really tough shots. I guess the Thunder, were, where the Thunder were just, especially Dub and Shea, were just getting to their spots at will. Um, there were some pretty fun plays, especially at the end of the half. Jay Will, or sorry, yeah, uh, end of the quarter, I should say. Jay Will uh, has like a Hail Mary pass to Chet, who dishes to Dub. Dub drives to the rim, gets fouled. Uh, just Kind of the epitome of the first quarter. Second quarter it was a little bit of a game of runs, but then Aaron Williams comes in, which is fantastic. Had 10 points during that stretch, and the Thunder end up being up 17 points heading into halftime. Third quarter is where it kind of got a little interesting. I was hoping the Thunder were just going to put the hammer down, would maintain that 20-ish point lead, and then the starters maybe could sit the second half. I even uh, was in a group text with some of my buddies, including Nick Crane, saying that I didn't really think regardless of the outcome, especially if the Bucks were resting so many people and their starters weren't going to play in the fourth, that I kind of could see the Thunder resting their starters as well uh, in the second half. But that wasn't the case. Milwaukee goes on 11-5 to runs, start the third. 
they ended up chipping into that 20 point lead that Thunder had, got it back down to 11. But then from there, Chet was just extremely physical. I mean, I thought he was fantastic there, especially in the third quarter. Uh, Hayward had maybe his most aggressive play in a Thunder uniform where he drove to the rim and got the end one. And then a couple of threes from Jay Will and Case and put the Thunder back up around that 18 mark. Honestly, from that point, the Thunder really didn't look back. Uh, the fourth quarter, they got back up to 18. Chet was still super aggressive. Thunder got back up 20 with about six minutes left, and Mark clears the bench, minus Lou Dort, who was shooting free throws. And then he was eventually benched as well. And like I mentioned, Milwaukee did not play any of their starters uh, in the fourth quarter. So time to dive into some of those big themes. But before I do, I don't have Silva here to play the awesome backdrop music. But we're going to talk about our sponsor for tonight's podcast. I already alluded to them, Spark OKC. Spark Joy at Scissor Toe Park's family-friendly joint Spark. Dive into their menu of burgers, bites, and cold delights. Don't skip the must-try BLC burger. I can confirm. Had some coworkers get it. They loved it. The pink fries, which obviously I have, we all hype up all the time. Frozen Peach Club Special, which I mentioned they're going to put a little tweak, uh, I believe a little bit of blue in there for the uncontested uh, post-game podcast on Sunday and rotating custard flavors of the month. Located directly west of Paycom Center, Spark is the best spot to hit before or after a Thunder game. And we all know two scoops or even three scoops of custard is better than one. So be on the lookout for Spark number two and three coming to Chisholm Creek and Nichols Hills later this spring and summer. I believe the Chisholm Creek location, don't quote me on this, is already open. Nichols Hills coming soon. So, like I mentioned, we'll be there live doing our podcast after the regular season finale. Can't wait to see you all there. We're really, really excited about it. Let's go ahead and jump into those big themes. I already touched a bit on Shea and Dub attacking early there in that first quarter. Uh, both were just getting to their spots at will. That's what was so exciting. Um, like I said, no Josh. So each of them had the ball in their hands a little more. It's not necessarily a bad or good thing. I'm not trying to say one way or the other. But Shea was just getting to the rim at will. He was hitting his setback jumpers. Just could not be stopped. He was getting fouled. He had 14 points after one quarter and six free throws. Six of six from the free throw line, I believe, and put Andre Jackson Jr. in an absolute blender, possession after possession when Andre checked in uh, there midway through the first quarter. Poor rookie. Talk about a welcome to the league moment. Shea just absolutely dominated him. Now, Shea's three-point shot was not falling. This is where I wanted to go ahead and pull up the stats. Uh, Shea, he definitely was looking for that three-point shot 0-7 oh, tonight from the floor, and honestly, a pretty inefficient night. For Shea Standard, seven of twenty, sorry, zero of seven from three from the floor, seven of twenty-one from the floor as a whole. Uh, Shea seemed to force a little bit there after that first quarter, uh, and there's. I, I, I just want to mention this. Don't mean to scare anybody, but our guy Nick Crane, like I mentioned, was there uh, covering the game, and he texted us or messaged us during the first quarter and said that I'm a little scared that. Shea maybe tweaked that quite a little bit because he did some kind of move. Um, he kind of limped on it a little gingerly and then kind of slapped at it or something like that. I'm not sure that's why Shea struggled the rest of, and I shouldn't say struggle, but didn't necessarily perform like he did in the first quarter the rest of the game. I think a lot of that was due to just the way the Thunder team was playing. It was a very balanced scoring effort. Like I mentioned in the second quarter when Shea came back in, Aaron Wiggins was playing so well. In the third quarter, it was Chet who was really taking over. So it could have just been kind of the um, the style of the game, the way the game was going. I thought Shea did a lot of good things in the second half, but he certainly was not nearly as aggressive, and he was looking for that shot. I mentioned the 0-7 from three just because it, it was very apparent that he wanted to get that going, and unfortunately, he wasn't able to. Um, but hopefully Shea's okay. I mean, he played the entirety of the game. There was no mention of it after. I'm sure he's fine, um, but it's just something to note. Meanwhile, Dub was fantastic as well. 11 points on four or five after the first quarter. Him and Shea were just in tandem, and we saw just how dangerous this team can be, especially when the game slows down in the playoffs. You're in the fourth quarter. You need buckets. <laughs> you have a lot of guys on this team who can get them, led by Dub and Shea, and both of them being healthy again is just uh, pretty incredible, and that first quarter was the perfect example of that. He had a huge dunk where he had a nice little hezzy move at the top of the key against Pat Bev. Just absolutely shook Pat Bev uh, out of his shoes. It was a little bit of a hesitation move, but a little bit of an inside out. Drives down the middle of the rim, uh, <laughs> middle of the lane for a huge dunk that got Paycom just absolutely rocking. Uh, Dub tonight finished with 17 points. 
two rebounds, five assists. He was seven of 12 from the four, one of three from three, only got to the free throw line two times, um, but had a steal and a block. Just continues to do J Dub things, continues to set up teammates. Again, another quiet second half from J Dub, which can be viewed as like a, if you're, you're looking at this glass half full. That just shows you how great this Thunder team was playing. They still were able to beat the Bucks by 18 plus for the majority of that second half when Dub and Shea didn't even have to necessarily take over. Um, at the same time, Dub also was not scoring quite as much uh, like he did in the first quarter, just similar to Shea. It was kind of interesting seeing their two games mirror each other tonight. Um, not anything I'm concerned about, but like I said, it's just a very balanced effort from OKC tonight. I thought Dub was great and still not one of his better games but somebody who did have one of his better games. Aaron Wiggins continues to save basketball. Uh, Wiggins ended the night with 19 points off the bench, which was by far uh, the most points off the bench. Three rebounds, three assists, eight of 12 from the floor. Only took two three-point attempts. He was one and two from uh, from three, had uh, three, fill, or sorry, three free throw attempts, and then two steals, and I thought he had a block. That's kind of crazy. Again, when you look back on the stats and you see some of these taken away, like, I thought Chet had more blocks than he had. We'll get into that yet again. Uh, but Wiggins was just absolutely fantastic. That second quarter was just the epitome of that, where he had 10 points in the second and really sparked the Thunder's run in the second quarter based off his defense. Uh, he only had one steal, like I mentioned, and he got that steal in the second uh, second quarter. But just getting deflections all over the place defensively, um, I, I mean, he was pushing the pace in transition, which, like I, like I talked about, is – really when the Thunder team is at their best. And I was largely led by Wiggins. Weirdly enough, and maybe not weirdly enough, for those of you who have followed the team for the entirety of the season, Wiggins gets this inconsistent playing time. We didn't see him at all in the third. And a lot of that was due to Gordon Hayward. Maybe a good time to just briefly touch on Gordon, even though he wasn't one of my uh, big takeaways. But he had six points, six rebounds, four of those, I believe, in the first quarter. Uh, two assists and was three of four from the four. He played fine, got 25 minutes. Uh, he was playing really good there in the third quarter. Like I mentioned, had his probably his most aggressive offensive possession of the season up there, uh, of the season when since he's been with OKC in the third uh, quarter there. And so I understand wanting to give Gordon a little more burn in the third. And I think that's probably why we didn't see Wiggins. But then Wiggins comes back in in the fourth and just continues to do the same things that he's been doing uh, the entirety of the game and really the past handful of seasons I believe I saw a stat where this is see if I have this here oh, darn it I don't think I do but I think it's like his fourth straight game with 10 plus points for Aaron Wiggins uh, and like I said he had another nine there in the fourth even though he uh, kind of hung around there during the garbage time um, when Mark cleared the bench Wiggins just continues to be fantastic on both sides of the basketball and I Fully expect him to have to have and to play a big role for this team. And if he doesn't, I'll be pretty disappointed. We touched about that uh, earlier, a couple of days ago on our group podcast. But um, really curious to see what Wiggins' rotations and minutes look like there, heading into the playoffs. My next one here, Chet dominates. He had, he was fantastic. He had 22 points, nine rebounds, three assists, nine of 13 from the floor, only one of four from three and three of three from the free throw line. But like I mentioned, he had those three blocks. He had one steal, uh, only had, let's see, I thought I had this. Yeah, only had two turnovers. Chet was fantastic. And honestly, I think he may have had a fourth that they didn't credit him with, a fourth block that they did not credit him with yet again. Chet was fantastic against a bigger quote unquote, big in Brooke Lopez, um, just his ability to be able to defend on the perimeter, being able to uh, defer shots at the rim. I mean, there's just not enough that can be said about Chet and his game. I know he's tired. Uh, there's been a ton of quotes recently over the past couple of, of games uh, where coach Dignant and his teammates have mentioned him wanting to play all 82 and how important that is for him. Uh, even I believe Mark said that I, I believe he said this pregame, but he said, yeah, we, we have actually talked to him about maybe taking some rest nights. And uh, he says something along the lines of, I'll let you all ask him about that because uh, it's pretty hard to keep him off the basketball floor. And that's just the kind of player that Chet is. He quite literally has that dog in him. And seeing Chet really kind of find his footing here after he struggled here over the past couple of weeks, uh, this past week has been much, much better. Getting that Chet heading into the playoffs is, I mean, it just makes his team 
<laughs> it really brings out the best in this team. I think it's the best way to put that. Uh, we saw what that looked like earlier in the season when they were playing so well. We saw what Chet looked like after the All-Star break. Mark actually alluded to that as well in that same pregame avail availability uh, when he was asked about Chet getting him about, I think it's like five days off uh, during the play-in until the playoffs actually start. Mark actually mentioned how well he looked after the All-Star break. So a lot of exciting things to talk about, Chet. Uh, we could go down the rabbit hole, talk about specific plays, but I don't think we need to do that. Just uh, glad that he's going to get some rest coming up. And I'm curious to see, I mean, he'll play on Sunday against the Mavericks. Curious to see how much he actually plays, though. The Thunder defense. The Thunder defense leads to transition offense. And like I said, that was largely led by Aaron Wiggins. The Thunder forced 17 turnovers with 13 stills. So 13 of the Bucks' 17 turnovers were a result of Thunder stills. They were just all over the place, getting their hands in passing lanes. Kaysen Wallace was fantastic there. Uh, Aaron Williams was fantastic there. Dub, Shea, and obviously Lou Dort, who was playing against Middleton for the first three quarters of the game. The Thunder defense was swarming, especially after they kind of got off to a bit of a slow start in the first quarter. That was just awesome to see. Um, and that led to 15 fast break points, which weirdly enough seemed kind of low to me. But I think when you actually look into it, there was much more fast break points if you include the free throws that those transition opportunities resulted in. Uh, the Thunder tonight were 18 of 20 from the free throw line, which is fantastic. Not only getting to the line 20 times or 10 times um, for 20 point attempts, but they only missed two of those, which has kind of been an issue here down the stretch with the tired legs. That's compared to the Bucks' 12 of 13 from the free throw line. Obviously, they were extremely efficient, uh, but only got to the line, like I mentioned, uh, for 13 attempts. That's pretty big. I think a lot of that can be tied back to the Thunder's defense and pushing that pace and transition lane to some of those fouls. The Thunder three-point shooting is just a quick aside I kind of want to mention because I've talked so much on this podcast about the Thunder. I mean, it seems very obvious. If a team is making their three-point shots versus missing them, they're probably going to win games when they're making them and lose them when they're missing them. Uh, again, very obvious there, but this Thunder team relies so much on that as the team who leads the league. I think they still lead the lead and three point percentage. Uh, they obviously take a lot of three point attempts, but tonight they were only 34% from three 13 of 38, not great. And when they've shot like that from the three point uh, from the three point line. And again, that's eight more three point attempts than the bucks attempted. We usually see them lose those games, but that wasn't the case tonight for a lot of the reasons I mentioned earlier with the turnovers that they were able to force, the defense that they played, and guys like Shea, Dub, Chet being able to just drive to the rim at will, draw fouls, and be extremely efficient there. And so I just found that really interesting uh, and also a little promising because I think come playoff time, obviously, three-point shooting for the Thunder is going to be critical and something that their opponents will try and crack down on. But we saw tonight that the Thunder can still win, win games even when that three-point shot isn't falling. So something to keep an eye on there. And then finally, let's go ahead and get into the big theme here. I'm sure that all of you all have uh, have questions about. It's very confusing. Uh, I actually talked to my guy Jacob two different times on the phone tonight after the game, trying to come up with a way to break this down in a clear manner that hopefully is educational uh, and not too confusing. So let's go ahead and get into the Thunder seating implications. If the Thunder end up in a three-way tie, like they currently are after all the games were played tonight, OKC gets first. And actually, we'll go ahead and mention that the Thunder won tonight, obviously, against the Bucks. Bucks. The <laughs> uh, let me scroll here. The Wolves ended up being the Hawks by three. Three. They almost lost that, which would have been huge. Uh, we would have, would have been talking about a whole different scenario and how important the Sunday games were, uh, even more important than they already are. So the Wolves end up being the Hawks by three, but the Nuggets lost to the Spurs by one point. Pretty insane. So currently in the three-way tie, which means OKC is first. So come Sunday, if the Thunder, Wolves, and Denver all win, obviously they're still in a three-way tie, and the Thunder will get the first seed. Also, if all three teams lose on the flip side, they're still tied uh, across the board and the Thunder will end up with that first seed. But if the Thunder end up in a two-way tie on Sunday with the Denver Nuggets, the Thunder have that tiebreaker as they are up 3-1, to one, I believe, on the season against Denver. Therefore, Thunder will still have that first seed. 
However, the Thunder do not have the tiebreaker against the Minnesota Timberwolves. So if Denver loses and the Thunder and Wolves both win, the Thunder will end up in that second seed. Finally, if both the Wolves and Denver Nuggets win on Sunday, but the Thunder lose, they end up back in the third seed. And so if the Thunder are one, kind of some implications of that. If the Thunder are in one, they end up with the Mavs or Clippers on their side of the, ba- uh, of the bracket, plus potentially the Los Angeles Lakers, given uh, depending on how the play-in ends up. And that's not necessarily ideal, although like Mark Day don't mention in his post-game availability where Tim McMahon, Van McMahon, was trying to get it out of him, um, they aren't concerned about that. They're going to just keep their heads down, and they're going to play the teams in front of them. Uh, it, given the series, they aren't going to look ahead. But as fans, we are looking ahead, and I would not like to see either of the Mavs and Lakers on the same side of the bracket for the Thunder. Also, the Thunder would have to wait until the plane is done to get their opponent if they end up in that one or two seed, depending on who won that final playing game. So that's not a huge deal. Obviously, there's enough time that these teams and, and these teams have so much film on each other already, scouting on each other already, that they're going to they can plan for multiple scenarios, depending on who wins and who loses the playing tournament. But there is something to be said about having more time to plan for your specific opponent, knowing that ahead of time. And that would be the case if the Thunder were in the three. Obviously, they would um, have first or second would have to wait. So just some small little quirks there uh, when it comes to Sunday's games. All 30 teams play at 2.30 on Sunday. This is something new they've done here the NBA, I believe, over the past a uh, couple of seasons because they don't want teams tanking or trying to win based off of opponents, uh, potential opponents in the, in the playoffs and play-ins. They want each team to, to just, you know, play at the same time, and then you'll find out the results afterwards. So like I mentioned, Sunday, we will be not going live like immediately after the game's over. We're going to wait and hang out a little bit because we want to see how all these uh, situations play out, how all these games play out. So that way, when we go live on Sunday at Spark OKC on the patio or inside, we'll see. Uh, we'll know for sure uh, what that looks like, where the Thunder are currently seated, but also their potential uh, first round matchups, depending on the plan. I think that's all I have. You guys dropped a ton of comments. When I'm going solo and I'm going like looking off my outline, it's really hard to keep up with all these. I'll just go through some of these like most recent ones. Um, Got our guy Ibrahim in here, Raw the Messenger. A lot of uh, names are constantly in here. We really appreciate all of you guys. There's a lot of talk about playing the Lakers. Uh, you all, that's something else that we love. You all have kind of built this community when we go live and you all go back and forth. It's really cool. Um, you guys were talking about the Lakers and that matchup. I already kind of got into that. It definitely could be, could be tough for sure. Uh, I still think I would take. I'm biased. I would still take the Thunder in a seven-game series there, but probably in seven games, and having to go through that in the first round just isn't ideal. Jordan Wright says, Wiggins is a hidden gem. Yes, another hidden gem for Sam Presti. Lou Dort goes undrafted. Wiggins goes late in the second round, and here they are playing. Isaiah Joe gets cut by the uh, Philadelphia 76ers, and all three are playing critical roles for this Thunder team. Matt Hurley, I for one never doubted that Thunder would get the one seed all season long. There we go, Matt. The confidence, I love it. Blue Face Baby uh, was with me. He says, live or die by the three. Cooper asks, do we think Giddy plays the last game? He got some rest tonight. I think Giddy does play since he didn't play tonight, but I also don't expect, I, I'm not even sure if I mentioned this yet. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this at the top of the podcast or not. The Thunder play, obviously, the Dallas Mavericks at 2.30. Uh, Central Time on Sunday, and it's already been determined by the Mavericks that Luca and Kyrie will be sitting. So we could see Shea and Dub automatically sitting. Um, and for those that do play, uh, those starters of OKC that do play, they probably don't see the second half of the game. That would be my guess. Uh, I kind of expanded that to more than just Giddy Cooper, but that is. What I'm thinking, Meek says, so are we actually most likely team to finish number one? I don't have those percentages pulled up in front of me. Go to our guy, Jacob's Twitter account, because he's all about the percentages and all the different sites that put that out. But yeah, it is uh, looking more and more likely after tonight's outcomes, which is fascinating. Actually, somebody might put that in here. Nope, never mind. 
that was everybody just reacting to my playoff uh, outcomes I got into. Finally, Alex says, Lindy Waters showing more confidence shooting the ball. Lindy's been awesome. Uh, Mark was actually asked about that after the game, and he mentioned just Lindy being able, like so many of these guys, to just step in a role. Uh, it doesn't matter when he's asked to. He comes in and can just be consistent. And he also mentioned how he thought Lindy was the best player on the floor for the Blue last night and their win in the finals against the main, uh, I'm already going blank on what their team name is, the Celtics G League team. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's something else to keep an eye on. I think it's tomorrow night. Don't quote me on that. Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure it is tomorrow night because there's like very little rest. I was surprised about that. Uh, but the Blue will be playing their final game in a three-game series in the finals uh, to get the G League championship. We'll see. I'm sure Lindy and Flagler didn't play tonight. Uh, Sar, they'll all be playing, I think, for the G League team. There's something to keep an eye on there. Thank you all. Uh, Monday night, my guy Donovan corrected me. Monday night, Maine Celtics. It is Monday night, Rob the Messenger. Okay, so Monday night, the OKC Blue play in the finals. Pretty crazy. So we'll have the season finale for the Thunder on Sunday. Like I mentioned, no Kyrie, no Luka. The uncontested guys, we will all be outside after the game doing a live podcast of Spark OKC. So stop by, grab some club specials, maybe some beers, sodas, whatever. Get you some burgers and the pink fries. Watch this podcast live. Hang out with us. Can't wait to talk about all the excitement heading into the playoffs. And then the OKC Blue will be playing their uh, final game in the championship on Monday night as well. So I think that's all I got, guys. Thank you all for tuning in to the uncontested post-game podcast edition, an extremely fun game to get to break down. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, an extremely fun and exciting season. So much excitement uh, heading into the, the playoffs. A lot of fun things that we can't even share yet. The Thunder have shared with us that they have planned coming up for the playoffs. So stay tuned. Come out. Be engaged. Go to the games. Let's make Loud City as loud as it's ever been, just like Thunder 1.0 when we were making those runs as a young team. Uh, can't wait. The uncontested will have you all covered for it the entirety of the way. And as always, and until Sunday's live podcast, Thunder Up.